Well, um, today we are going to uh, return slightly to uh, an area closer to my uh, area of, of expertise, and we have as our guest my School of Architecture colleague, Ivan Rupnik. We'll be talking about the design complexities in a very specific area, designing public spaces in post-communist Croatia. I think you'll find that this is an extremely interesting topic and germane to what we've been talking about, um, especially around the, uh, one of our eight words, the notion of context uh, in all of its forms. And so I think we'll, we'll learn a lot about that. Ivan Rupnik holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Louisiana State University and a Master of Architecture with distinction from Harvard's Graduate School of Design. From 2005 until 2007, he was the principal instructor of the architectural program at Harvard's Career Discovery Program. And from 2005 to 2006, he was an assistant professor at Syracuse University's School of Architecture. He is the author of Project Zagreb, Transition as Condition, Strategy, Practice, published by Akhtar in 2007. Also, he is the author of A Peripheral Moment, Experiments in Architectural Agency, also published by Akhtar in 2010. He uh, also edited Homework, Contemporary Housing Delivery Systems in 2011, and since 2007, he has served as an urban design and planning consultant to the University of Zagreb's Spatial Planning and Development Office. Please join me in welcoming Ivan Rupnik. Um, thank you, George, and thank you for coming on a beautiful day. Uh, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, and I think this, the lecture will expand and then contract very quickly, but I have a simple question for you, which I'll answer myself. What do painters do, right? Well, painters paint paintings. It's a pretty easy uh, question, it's a pretty easy answer. There's Pablo Picasso, he's working on a painting and we're gonna see the same product the way that he saw it. So what do architects do? Um, that's the way I think I'll start our discussion. Um, for this, I'll turn to Robin Evans, an architect, design theorist, and an educator, a studio instructor. So what do architects do? Well, according to Evans, um, this is a little bit of a, 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 a recollection of his from his days starting to teach studio. Bringing with me the conviction that architecture and the visual arts were closely allied, I was soon struck by what seemed at the time the particular disadvantage under which architects labor, never working directly with the object of their thought, always working at it through some intervening medium, almost always the drawing, while painters and sculptors who might spend some time on our preliminary sketches and maquettes all ended up working on, on the thing itself, as we saw in the, in the case of Picasso. Um, so the sketch and the maquette, uh, Evans continues, are much closer to the painting and sculpture than a drawing is to a building. There's this divorce. And the process of development, the formulation, is rarely brought to a conclusion within these preliminary studies. This resulting displacement of effort and indirectness of access still seem to me to be the distinguishing features of architecture. Whether this is always and necessarily disadvantageous is another question. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about this distance and using that to frame my work and also both as a researcher and a, and a, and a designer. Um, so the distance between, this, this, this distance in architecture, I would say has arisen since the Middle Ages from a progressive stepping back of the architect from the artifact. To see the bigger picture in order to organize, uh, the distance has been growing over time. So while some architects as the young Le Corbusier in 1906, had a chance to construct their own architects, uh, artifacts. Most work uh, is done through layers of intermediate media. So the older Le Corbusier, uh, explaining the significance of seagulls on the Piazza del San Marco in Venice uh, for a scheme that he was proposing in Algeria. So not only is it a drawing, it's not even of the project. Um, and so at times architects have constructed new types of intervening media, to use a term from Evans, in order to simulate a method of building assembly that doesn't look anything like the building. Uh, and you can see the relationship there, or even to study new patterns of occupation. Here's the Eameses, uh, Charles and Ray Eames, the studying an ex exhibition. But this distance remains, and I again, it's growing, I would say. Um, so I would argue that during the 20th century, this distance has been increased through an ever-expanding set of regulatory parameters. This new virtual context has in many ways become tangible, as tangible as the material and cultural conventions 
uh, that defined architectural practice since the, uh, in, in, in previous eras. James Benninger has even described this moment, uh, this, this virtual context, as what he calls the control revolution, uh, and he sees it as the sort of roots of our information uh, society. So a virtual context, really. And here you can see uh, an evolution of a pre-regulated housing block in New York, uh, and by 1916, one that, uh, again, is as much designed by a series of, of parameters as it is by any one author. And that's something I find very interesting in my own work. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, sorry. Within this context, new, so new modes of practice, new intermediate media have developed in response. And their impact uh, is, not, is often only visible when studied in multiple scales. So at the scale of, of the building, but also at the scale of the urban context. This is just a diagram from, that I developed looking at the change of a typical rural block um, and how both kind of street regulation, but also building regulation, the placement of the toilet started to impact both the building, but also the, the environment. So no regulations, regulated infrastructure, regulated types, and then a, a, this kind of ambiguous situation of authorship. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this building on the left is, is distinguishable from its surroundings, the white building that you can see, not only because of the stylistic preferences of its author or its material rendition, but because it is operating under a different set of legal parameters than the buildings around it. Um, and on the right, you just have a kind of mapping that I developed, a technique I developed, where instead of taking, I took a series of apartment buildings from 1890 to 1940, all working more or less in the same context, in the same regulatory context, and just identified what was actually defined by all of these different parameters. So the architect is actually, what the architect has done and what these parameters have done is somewhat of a disjunction, if, and it's definitely an expanded distance, right? The distance is expanding uh, in the 20th century. And I find this very interesting in my own work. Um, so in this research, the research, my own research um, in this area has focused uh, on uh, Croatia um, for the simple reason that the Croatian context has provided a fruitful mix of regulation, so it's not an unregulated context, revolution, uh, as well as architectural ambition. So those three parameters have proved uh, generate a kind of interesting laboratory for understanding this notion of distance, for understanding how new uh, techniques of design emerge um, at, with, with transition on the one hand, with instability, but on the other hand with a, a, a kind of desire to have a kind of set of operations. So you can, on the left is Project Zagreb, which George mentioned already, uh, which looked at the development of uh, the city over 150 years and identified 16 practices uh, which began as exceptional uh, responses to instability and then became exemplary models for regulation. So that, not just that they were exceptional, but that they eventually became, went from exceptional to a model of normative practice. That's what I was very interested in. And the second book, A Peripheral Moment, uh, in which instead of working with historian like I did in Project Zagreb, I actually worked with 10 architects, 10 living architects, which is tough to do, as George knows, um, and tried to understand what the recent decade in Croatia after the fall of communism had done to change both the regulatory environment on the one hand, as well as the individual practices on the other. So again, this kind of the design of design, the framing of a context within which we work, and then how we operate within that, and how we develop new tools, new methods. Um, but what I'm going to be talking most about today um, is uh, the way that the research from Project Zagreb um, has informed uh, two projects that I've been working on uh, for the last four years. Uh, the strategic plan for Campus Borongai in Zagreb, developed in collaboration with Vice Rector Boyan Balitic of the Spatial uh, Planning Department of the University of Zagreb, uh, where we've developed a regulatory and disciplinary framework for further architecture development. Uh, of a new academic campus, uh, and then an urban design for the so-called central urban scape of Zagreb, and I'll explain more what that is, uh, developed in collaboration with Helena Pavernirich, where the goal was to convert the call for a monument into a spatial and temporal informal network. So, um, so starting with Borongai, with this campus planning, um, in the development uh, of the strategic plan for Borongai campus, that's the name of the campus, um, Project Zagreb, this research that I did, provided a toolbox for the university, uh, reconstructing its own historic role as an agent of city building and not only as an institution of higher education. So with this new campus, so on the left, the white outline is a series of parks that were actually developed 
in, in tandem with the university, and uh, the university was the major actor, the major agent, and those parks helped direct the development of the city through a fairly un unstable period. Uh, so understanding for the university, uh, giving them examples, giving them case studies of actually their own practices, but practices they, haven't, they, had, they had seen as exceptional, but not as exemplary. Uh, and developing those tools for them. You actually, in a way, almost helping them understand what they had done in the past. To use a new site, a larger site, you can see on the white, the kind of poly polygonal shape, to develop um, and direct the development of an east the eastern part of Zagreb, which has about 250,000 citizens, but lacks the kind of cultural and social infrastructure that this, the old center has. Um, so one of the first things that we did was we realized that the Borongai site, the blue outline on the far right, uh, was actually a strategic zone for traffic planning for the city. The university, by building a tram line, a fairly short tram line, could complete a loop, uh, which would give the city a public transportation system for a, a relatively small investment. So the university, again, could become a leader, something we take for granted uh, in a North American context, but something that's unique in continental Europe. And also, on the northern edge of the site, the orange line, as you can see it, the northern edge of the site, maybe you can, well, I don't, it, it's the, a blue, the blue outline, Borongai above it, uh, that even in the long term, so in the short term developing a tram line, in the long term even developing a, a hub which would allow for a, tran a transfer from inner city trains to light rail. So again, how this university could become uh, an institution of city building, really. And we also looked at how um, the distribution of uh, the new, of, of this, the construction of this new campus on the far right, where the red numbers would at, at once uh, create a new academic community, but um, we also had to deal with the fear that the city had of totally losing its student population from the old center. So this diagram was really designed to show that uh, instead of thinking of it as uh, a vacation of the city, of this important institution from the city center, that we were creating a, a network of consolidated campuses. Um, so another thing that was important in the process was educating both the university and the city of Zagreb uh, about uh, the campus tradition. You, you, we all take it for granted, but the campus, this interdisciplinary, integrated housing and faculties uh, in one space is a particular North American tradition or an Anglo-Saxon tradition. And in continental Europe, um, at least since Napoleon, this has not been the case. So you have faculties that are separate from, that don't really come together in a campus and they don't really share resources. And also housing is not considered really as part of that academic experience. So I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but looking at uh, UVA, which is for, for us proved to be a kind of good prototype, Harvard, which on the other hand developed over time, um, as well as uh, kind of historic campuses in Zagreb, uh, a new campus proposal by Keith Christians uh, for the ETH Science City, which actually took a lot of the lessons from North American universities and made it easier for us to explain to local Europeans that this wasn't such an alien idea, bringing housing together with, uh, with academic facilities, and all, putting it all in the scale um, of the city. Uh, I also conducted a series of uh, of a series of really real research looking at how students uh, at Harvard use the campus uh, as a way to explain to uh, people in Croatia, people in Zagreb, about the need and the benefits, both the practical benefits of having a compact set of institutions, housing um, in one place, which allowed you to plan and in a flexible way, but also the idea that without that kind of framework, without those shared resources, it's difficult to build a culture of interdisciplinarity. You can't just say you want interdisciplinarity. There is actually some very specific aspects to the campus structure which allow for an inter interdisciplinarity. And those different colored routes are actually following freshmen, second, third, fourth year students, graduate students, and faculty around, the, around how they use the campus. Uh, and then in scale, that little circle is um, the actual proposal, the camp, part of the campus proposal. And it only even turns out that Harvard is not so different in scale, the old campus, from what we're looking at the red outline on the bottom right, um, is, is, uh, is the actual campus site that we're looking at in Zagreb. It also involves a series of workshops, so designing uh, a kind of process where we invited uh, architects from Switzerland, from Boston, Peter Rose, as well as architects from Croatia, if nothing else, for political reasons, to, to be involved and to even test out our early ideas about um, about the uh, campus program and about the, uh, the, the traffic uh, strategy that I just talked about, um, and use this to kind of build consensus 
uh, without having the kind of stakes that these were actually exactly going to be built this way. So we have five proposals, and the five proposals uh, created a discussion without creating the kind of um, tensions that real proposals tend to create among various constituents. It's a little bit like studio for those of you that are in, in architecture school. Um, so we also prepared uh, myself, Professor B uh, Balatich, and another uh, professor who's actually an expert in competition design, interestingly enough. We prepared a, a, a kind of design brief for a competition for the campus. So in a way, it's, it's a different process. It's a curation process. Instead of designing a specific project, you're trying to define certain parameters, uh, some of which are very specific. For example, the transportation corridor was pretty much set, uh, and other things were looser. So this is just some pages from this booklet that all of the, the competition en entrants who were going to participate in this open competition in Zagreb uh, would get. We also even organized a series of lectures, almost a little class on campus design once we had architects who were interested in competing for the design of this campus. This is, it had to be a public competition, by the way. It's kind of a law in Croatia. Um, we decided, well, none of them have ever done a campus. How would they know what a campus is like? Is it just a matter of inspiration? No, there's actually some skills. There's some knowledge. So we organized uh, six or seven of these lectures um, and helped them kind of get up to speed. So by 2011, so that was 2008, 9, 10. By 2011, we held a competition. It was won by uh, an architect by the name of Khrvoj Nirich, uh, Nirich Plus. Um, and I'm not going to go too much into detail, but really, he, uh, you can sort of see, uh, well, you can see the gray zone, which is a kind of transit corridor, uh, and then these three kind of academic clusters, which all have both housing and um, and faculties. Um, but what was also interesting for us, something we really insisted, we, we wanted a sustainable strategy, but also one that was low tech, uh, and one that the university saw as an opportunity to develop new techniques and export. So in this case, this is a study of uh, just the sort of site massing and how that massing, how the land work, uh, this foundation work could help with um, rainwater mitigation. Um, and again, the, this is a rendering of one of these academic clusters, which was a difficult process to convince the university even because it combined housing with faculty buildings, which is something that just really goes against the culture uh, of academic institutions in, in Europe right now. You know, in this kind of new environment where a new kind of academic institution, a more open one, and maybe a more sustainable one, is both a prototype uh, in terms of um, a way of studying, but also we hoped beyond the specific academic uh, context could provide for lessons for almost uh, strategies to export about sustainable urbanism at this very large scale. After all, campuses are one of the last sort of utopian spaces or spaces where one can experiment today. Um, and what's interesting is even the architect who won the competition himself had to transform that design, his vision, into another set of parameters. So we've been working with the architect to translate his specific vision, his very particular architecture, into another set of parameters for 24 more architectural competitions. So he has to translate now his forms, his spatial concepts, into a series of rules for playing safe is what I like to call it. Uh, and this is, this is an ongoing process, uh, and, we're ho and the project is also supported by the European Union, um, so they're very interested in what we're producing beyond the physical material, what we're producing in terms of knowledge. Okay, so that was, um, that was the basic, uh, that was a little bit about the campus planning project that I don't want to go into too much detail, um, so now I'm going to shift a little bit and focus to a sec the second project, um, this project for a central urban space. Uh, escape in Zagreb, uh, which I've been working on since 2008 uh, with, um, with uh, uh, Helena Pavrinirich, who's an architect who's based in Zagreb. Um, just one second. So, um, as so after the completion of Project Zagreb, the book also, uh, I was asked to collaborate on, this, on the design of a contentious public space in, the, in, in Zagreb's uh, geographic center. And these quotes uh, from the completion of the book, um, and recently are just there to give you a little bit of the sense of the political climate in Zagreb. I'm not going to decipher them for you, uh, maybe uh, keep them in the back of your head. Uh, but what's important to understand, this is a photo of Zagreb, the center of Zagreb. Um, as part of the multiple political transition, transitions that Zagreb has experienced over the last century and a half, a number of urban voids have been left behind in key parts of the city. So, you can kind of see the green, there's a, green, there's a red arrow and a green lawn looking space. Um, that's the site. Um, and it's called the, the Green Bowl, for lack of a better word. It was generated by a traffic planning project in the 60s, one that imagined that a new city would be located on this site. 
something that has only partially been realized. Uh, with the City Hall, the Symphony, and the National Library moving to the site, but the site never really being fully consolidated, sort of staying a kind of unfinished uh, space. This, so this urban void, this big white hole in the city, uh, or green hole in the city, has remained a question mark since then, uh, until 2008, that is, until Mayor Milan Bandic, a very active character, a sheriff, some call him, as you saw from one of the quotes, decided to formalize, to beautify uh, this, what him, for him was a leftover space through the addition of two fountains. He knew he wanted two fountains, uh, and he came to Helena, who also then contacted me, um, and said, you know, I'd like two fountains, but I don't know what else I want, and I know people are going to not understand what I want. I want something beautiful. I want something formal. Um, and we sort of got into the process of trying to step back a little bit and say, well, what, what, how is this site really formed? How is it informed? Again, Project Zagreb was very helpful in this process. Uh, and we sort of stepped back and delaminated this site. So the site itself, historically, until the, until the beginning of the 20th century, was the, a, a floodplain of the Sava River. Uh, so you had these kind of interesting moments um, where light infrastructure and almost a series of little swamps um, and that until the, there was regulation of the river. Uh, and after that, during much of the 20th century, uh, it's, it was on the wrong side of the railroad tracks. You can see the railroad tracks kind of cutting through the image. And on the left, you can't see the site, but you can see a series of rural settlements um, that were kind of expanding as the city industrialized. Very typical of a number of cities all over the world. But what was interesting about this is that um, a, a series of public parks uh, in, in the more consolidated part of the city created in people's imagination this idea of a central axis kind of continuing through what was a very informal, very underdeveloped area. And this, this went beyond just architects. Uh, there was a kind of general consensus this was the future of this site. So in the 1960s, uh, as was the case in a number of places, um, there was a kind of aggressive move to build some infrastructure, car-focused infrastructure to cross the Sava River, they, to, to move the city hall. Uh, but really, the kind of rural character remained. So you can really see that um, literally one of these rural villages was cut in half um, by uh, this traffic planning. Uh, so this is another view, maybe 10 years later. Um, this kind of mix of modernist planning, rural settlements, and this, this space which started to kind of have its own character already, um, a kind of, even a kind of beauty for, uh, for us. Um, and so we, we understood also that, again, that space had a reality on the ground, a kind of very mixed, very complicated, very messy reality. But it was also part of a virtual understanding of the city, which we also tried to excavate. This idea of this kind of more and more formal axis by 1947, on the drawing on the top, uh, really a kind of entry into the city. So that void um, became more clear once we understood how it, how it, uh, it resided in the collective imagination. It also happened to be a place where a lot of strange things happened. So the American Bicentennial, for example, uh, which was a traveling exhibition in 1977-78, was actually staged there. It was a nice large space. It had a kind of prominence. Uh, Buck Buckminster Fuller even designed the pavilion. Um, and it actually, uh, the, the mayor himself, Mr. Bondage, um, has used this space for his own kind of political rallies. Um, and has, uh, so this is the launching pad of his hot air balloon, which floats around and kind of advertises his campaigns. Uh, and also, what's, what's interesting, I just put up some of his little campaign posters, uh, and the mayor saw himself as a kind of city builder, as someone who, um, you know, a kind of, not a patron of architecture so much, he didn't really pay for a lot of these projects, some of them are even private, but as someone who supported that initiative, who, who saw himself, um, whether it's true or not, as a, as, a, as a supporter of this. We also noticed that, um, like the fountains in, his, in, in Mr. Bondage's mind, or the central axis, the space was full of, Symbols, like this part of the world is, uh, symbols that we thought were maybe oversaturated. Uh, and we weren't sure why another symbolic object, uh, a fountain, uh, a formal object, uh, really need was needed in this space. And even if those two very monumental objects could really define such a large space, what could they do? They would be lost. So the first thing we did uh, was to say, well, look, Mr. Bondage, um, if you want these things to be visible from a car's distance and you want them to be these fountains to be viewed from a distance, you need 1,200 nozzles to have any impact if you want this kind of object. So why don't we think about a different idea of a fountain? Why don't we think about, instead of a fountain, let's think about a, a kind of watery volume, something that can be occupied, something that can be seen from a distance, and something that only uses 200 nozzles, by the way. Uh, it's a little cheaper for you. 
Uh, and then what if we started to perforate that volume? What if we started to treat it like a piece of architecture, like a space to be inhabited? Um, and you could get five of these things for the same price as one of your monumental vo vo uh, uh, volumes. There's 1,000 nozzles um, instead of 1,200. And we also, as architects, started to experiment with what a kind of ephemeral um, materiality we could generate with this material, uh, something we weren't familiar with. You know, um, in Croatia, most things are built with concrete and re reinforced concrete or well, mostly reinforced concrete, and in this country, maybe it's steel or wood, but building out of water was a challenge for us, and understanding how a very large space like this could be activated um, and address the monumentality desire that the mayor had, and a lot of, not just the mayor, as well as our idea of maybe developing something that's more informal, that's more pedestrian scale, that's uh, more about also connections. So these are just some early renderings, looking at light, looking at night and day, um, and again, what we brought to the table was we, we also decided that this east-west connection that the mayor had not really addressed in his own ideas was something that was really important um, both for the character of the site but also for his own ability to make this project, uh, uh, let's say, acceptable to the public. So these ideas that there was literally a kind of town that was sliced in half, a little neighborhood, was something that we really wanted to address you know, by this north-south axis. We wanted to bring back this east-west connection. We wanted to bring also back an informality with that east-west connection as opposed to this very formal entry into the city. So this is the most important, I would say, drawing of the project for us. It's been the most useful project. So it, it sort of maps out in red the key elements, some of which are part of the project, some of which are given. So you can see there's a kind of arrow going north and south. That's the high-speed traffic, the, the infrastructure, which is still very much in effect. Um, but the kind of little, what we call lassos, are really the old paths that once cut through uh, this site and which we wanted to kind of bring back. Uh, and then you can see the red cubes are these, space, uh, these water rooms, these water volumes, which we also saw as potentially having some relationship with the old fabric that was there. Uh, so creating a large volume, but also a volume that can break down, so, something that only architecture can really do, kind of almost take two contradictory ideas, formal and informal, uh, large void and dense fabric, and actually combine them. And so we were really seriously interested in how those two aspects could be combined. Uh, and we were also interested, again, in, the, in the creating a multimedia landscape. Uh, we understood that there was a lot of assets to this site, one of which is the traffic having cars driving by at a kind of lifted, uh, uh, lifted um, elevation is sort of the opposite of the high line, which maybe you, some of you have seen. Instead of thinking about an infrastructure above, uh, pedestrian infrastructure above, we actually took advantage of having the pedestrians actually below and having the cars become a kind of feature in a way. This was the beginning of the construction. <laughs> so for a long time, for about two years from 2000, Eight till 2010, there was no progress made uh, on the site. We weren't allowed to show pictures of it. It was very controversial. And then all of a sudden, the mayor got approval, um, and then he actually decided to have a kind of a city build, city works company build it. And they decided that instead of uh, just closing traffic or using some more expensive burrowing technology to build these tunnels that were so important for us, these pedestrian routes, they would simply change traffic over the summer, so two summers ago, um, and reroute it through what was the, the bowl, something that, honestly, as architects, we weren't expecting um, that kind of decision, although it turned out to be much cheaper, it turned out to be much more effective. Of course, I have family in Zagreb, and Helena lives there, and knowing that we were the people that caused everyone to have these traffic uh, delays was something that made us very unpopular about two summers ago. So, uh, and, you know, we dealt with, there was a lot of issues with the site, the kind of the way that the landscaping would, would go into a kind of steep slope. Uh, we also took advantage of the local, there's a very strong local tradition of precast that has really actually turned out to be quite excellent in this project, and that has helped uh, the budget as well as the, the quality of the site. Um, and then you can see, again, this kind of, the kind of infrastructure uh, that it took to, you'll see what the rend rendering, oh, that the rendering is what the photographs look like, but this is the kind of infrastructure that even placing a few pedestrian tunnels in a few um, really watery uh, environments takes. So that little pedestrian tunnel there, um, which you can see now, uh, it's a little dark, sorry, but this is sort of the effect. So this is an image uh, looking from the National Library across. You can see the aspect, most of the aspects of the intervention here. Um, two of the five um, water rooms which have been completed and one of the very important uh, pedestrian routes uh, which I'll kind of uh, walk you through. And the kind of qualities that that 
space has. I'm just going to run this through. We can always go back through it. Where's the little girl? Where is she? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to stop here for a sec. But this idea that, um, as you saw, we could create a kind of large volume that was visible from a car that fulfilled the desires of a politician, really, for monumentality, but not just a politician, a lot of the senior citizens <laughs> also in Zagreb, um, as well as to kind of create a more interactive environment, one that different age groups feel comfortable in, and one that invites you to participate, right? So not a fountain that you view from a distance, but as this little girl who's kind of crawling through, found out something you can really engage. Um, and you can see there's a little detail. I'm not going to go through all the details, but um, the fountains seem like they're inaccessible, and that's actually because the mayor didn't want us to make them accessible. Uh, but we actually secretly placed these little steps at different heights. So actually, when you, when you get there, you can actually walk across in high heels without getting wet. So we thought, you know, all the models in Croatia, I don't want to get them mad at me. I have all my relatives mad at me for the traffic. You know, you can actually uh, walk through as people very quickly found out. So that's another important thing about the space that is not only is it not monumental, but it, it creates kind of uh, social habits. It doesn't force them, but it creates opportunities for a certain way of using space. And you can see, it's also funny actually, you can't maybe tell from the photographs, but something we were actually conscious of is how different constituencies would use it. And by having two of these volumes, for example, the teenagers have chosen their, their space for the evening and the kind of families have chosen their space to the left. And it's something that's really important uh, in designing public spaces, not so much forcing a certain habit, but being able to frame sort of public experience. I'm just gonna go through some of these. But really an ephemeral architecture and one that participates with even this kind of environment. What's also very important for us is that we saw this um, as an opportunity not only to make a proposal, but sort of coming back to the idea of designing design, to uh, sort of create an armature for other, other authors, uh, sort of like in a different way the campus design or designing the campus competition in the first example. Uh, we wanted to make uh, kind of a media, really, to create an architecture as a kind of media. So this is actually a photograph. It's very abstract and kind of beautiful. But what it is, is it's actually a photograph. The, the, the construction workers had their own little opening party. Uh, and the head, of the, the head foreman wanted to uh, project, and this is something you can do. I didn't talk about it. I'll, I'll explain it now. But you can actually project images onto, the, onto these fountains. And he brought a film of his niece. Uh, and he decided that was going to be... Um, projected during this event as part of the atmosphere. And so the idea here was, again, that you could take this almost set of tools, this really watery architecture, this light, these projections, and you could give it to different people, different constituencies, not just to use on a daily basis, but for even particular kinds of events. So this more informal party, or the Zagreb Philharmonic, the symphony, uh, which is nearby, also in April of this year, um, used it to stage one of its first concerts. And again, how we were involved in helping them use that space, st stage their stage in a way. And of course, we've been very helpful in Mr. Bondich's re-election campaign, unintentionally. Um, but, you know, given him a backdrop uh, that he's used a lot. Um, and again, we've, he was the, let's say, the initiator of the project, um, and we had to kind of negotiate his, his will against the will of the, against what we thought was an important um, desire of the public, which maybe politicians sometimes don't fully consider, or at least don't know how to engage. And just, um, just, if you, just because we also have some difficulties with this guy, because he is very, uh, he's, a, he's a very active character. For example, uh, in January, while we were designing these very elegant uh, seating elements, he just couldn't wait. And so he got, he went out and bought some pretty cheap, uh, pretty standard uh, park benches, and literally had himself photographed putting them in um, in the middle of winter onto the site as it, as it was being completed. Um, so this is just, a, just to give you an image of last week. This is a set of diagrams between myself, uh, Helena, and Mr. Bandic explaining the kind of concept and the need for a different approach to seating. So this process, this pr project is ongoing. Um, and these are the kinds of drawings also that, you know, sometimes you need uh, that really focus in on, uh, in, they're not so technical, they're more about explaining certain set of con concepts. And so this literally diagram went along with those photographs to make an argument for thinking through those benches. But in closing, the idea of, again, making a multimedia environment, one that really takes advantage of the site, 
uh, as well as uh, ex you know, accepting the entry uh, sequence into the city uh, and also adding a layer that wasn't called for by the project, this layer of east-west connections, uh, and then using the fountains as a kind of device in, in between, in between the formal and the informal, in between the fast north-south axis and the slow east-west connection. Uh, and these are just renderings, just in closing. You can see that's the, the, this is looking north in the city. The top two fountains are what you've seen um, in the renderings, and three more are supposed to be constructed. They've been approved uh, next year, um, and this is looking south. And so again, the idea of building, this is a drawing by Albert Durer, but it's the one I also enjoy uh, for architecture and for thinking about this, how we make these instruments to, to not just overcome the distance between art, author and artifact, uh, but to kind of engage that distance. And so going back to Evans's kind of quote at the beginning, the resulting displacement of effort and indirectness of access still seem to be the distinguishing features of architecture. Whether this, always a necessarily, is, whether this is always necessarily disadvantageous is another question. My experience, and I hope some of the projects show that both through a kind of regulatory design as well as through a kind of uh, public spaces framework, you can really kind of occupy as a designer that space in between uh, and, and sort of embrace the distance that architects have since we do get to work with people's lives in a way that, ar that ar artists may not. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. That was really um, offered us a great deal uh, uh, that's very relevant, I think, for what we're talking about in this course for us to discuss. You should know that in the space of two or three class meetings, we go from talking about um, recyclable oil filters for automobiles to restaurants to monuments in Croatia. So, yeah. so th these well, folks have got to, have got to remain uh, supple. Um, let's start with, um, I, I think you're, um, I, I'm going to pass by the allusions to um, the indirectness mm -hmm. uh, of experience, which though it's a really, I think that's a really interesting topic. Um, let's talk for a second about maybe a, a more mm -hmm. basic distinction, which I think these memorial or these monuments, excuse mm -hmm. me, well, these now very experiential public spaces that began as monuments, maybe, right. or mm -hmm. who's totally. in the mayor's right. mind's eye and perhaps in the cultural mm -hmm. history of Zagreb started as monuments and are now much more experiential landscapes. Or landscapes. Yeah. So it brings to mind for me, how many people in this class have, and forgive me if I've already asked you this question, uh, you know, my memory is starting to go. Um, how many have been to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial by Maya Lin in Washington, D.C.? A fair number, okay. I would argue that that is a major turning point, at least in American uh, monuments because it, it is the moment when precisely what you're talking about happens and memorials cease to be things that we go to and statically look at mm -hmm. and become something that for, from then onward we are expected to experience mm -hmm. in some sort of transformative way. I wonder if you want to talk about that a little bit with regard to the fountains because I think that they seem to live at precisely this place. Well, you know, and f just to add a, a layer of complexity is that this is the Balkans, and there was a war very recently. Um, and I actually, the, the year that I started this project, I, I was the first Croatian American to give a lecture on Zagreb in Belgrade. Um, and so I gave a lecture actually on Belgrade, capital of Serbia. Serbia, which was there was some dif some difficulties in the 90s, uh, and it was, it was really great to have that dialogue. Um, and one of the things I presented was a series of actual monuments in Zagreb. Mm -hmm. um, we had a discussion about you know, real symbolic monuments. And this was in the back of sort of my, my memory when we started working on this project. They're in, they're in the book, mm -hmm. the Project Zagreb. Um, and so the idea of how you, you know, how, like Maya Lin, you don't just abstract out the desire for symbolism, but you almost have to, you have to deal with the desire for figura figuralism, for symbolism, for meaning, mm -hmm. not by ignoring it, but by trying to engage uh, people by, to construct other meaning. Right. So you, you, it's almost like it has to be full, it's like, a, it's like equal weight. And so that's something that in, in, a, in the broadest sense I think she does quite well. I mean, she also balances the content, but also provides another meaning instead of, instead of simply abstraction. Sure, sure, sure. Well, at the vet, and Veterans Memorial, I, I guess I would argue that one of the reasons it is so powerful is precisely because it is a both and 
memorial as opposed to like an either or. Mm -hmm. It is um, whether you were are going to there to visit the the, the uh, memory of a loved one, or whether you were in opposition to that war, there is a way for you to understand that and to uh, um, elicit meaning from it. Um, and, and I think that's so powerful um, because it allows the participant uh, to play an active role. And that then gets maybe a little bit to this whole question of designing in a post-communist mm -hmm. setting where meaning is so fraught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's not that meaning isn't fraught in this country, but it's not the same. If, you know, if we were talking about um, monuments on the battlefield at Gettysburg in the 1870s, that's a little bit more fraught. <laughs> but, but we're not, generally. Mm -hmm. I mean, in other words, our Civil War was 150 years ago, and so... It's more recent. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's interesting. And so the very notion of a monument or monumentalizing something, the immediate memory, I would imagine, of Croatians is of a, a very specific set of ideas being embodied in what are monuments. Right. And, and, and a notion of dictatorship. I mean, I didn't show the image that would have been the perfect image to show, which is Zagreb never had a statue of Tito, who was the Yugoslav dictator. But in 1989, a year before the Yugoslavia collapsed, they were thinking about putting it there. Mm -hmm. So, and the fact that, again, in, in this case, what was even maybe more difficult was not that we were fighting against um, an agenda for a monument. There was an anti-monument agenda for a monument to begin with, mm. if that makes any sense. And we, it, actually, you know, we just had a great conversation in the seminar about how the Barcelona Pavilion mm -hmm. in Barcelona, designed by Mies van der Rohe, not as famous, was really the way that the Germany after World War I was trying to be anti-monumental. Mm, mm. uh, and it, I just, the, the students came up with it, I didn't, but, um, but it's, it's the same idea that we already, our brief was to be non-monumentally monumental, <laughs> as opposed to, oh, someone wants a figural monument, although it sort of was, but the idea was, no, no, you, we already can't be that, but how do you want it, how can you be monumental anyway? Well, let's tease that out a little bit, because now this is where we get to really the content of this course, because when, when these folks are seeing designers make various types of decisions, they inevitably ask, well, why? How are they making these decisions? Um, and I think it is, of course, in the nature of how we question the question or take apart what we think to be the assignment, what, let's say, the mayor gave to me, and you say, well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. It's very nice. It's very nice <laughs> of you. We're interested. But now we need to, whether on our own time mm -hmm. or in the conversation with him, probably not in the conversation with him on the first, yeah. you take it back to your lab mm -hmm. and you take the assignment apart. When he says monument, what exactly does that mean? Because he also followed that up with, I, I, okay, when he says monument, he means something maybe large, monolithic, memorable, iconic. Okay, we write down those words. Then there's the question of what is the anti, what is the anxiety here? And I guess that you had to tease out maybe stuff that wasn't fully verbalized in that brief about, yes, but we don't want it to be oppressive. Right. Well, and again, because he didn't, he wasn't explicit about monumentality, what we ended up having to do was to sort of anticipate what the response would be, not from him, but from his political opponents, from the, yeah. so the real, it was almost imagining what happened actually, which I didn't again go through, the public response, which was an inherently negative. And the reason it was a negative was that we didn't have, he didn't know what to say the monument was or who it was to. Right, right, right. We couldn't show the image. We actually, he wouldn't let us communicate with the public. That's sure. just part of a little bit of a paranoia and a little bit of a leftover from a different regime. Sure. Um, and so the, the public imagined monuments on the site. Right, they, right. So there was, I mean, again, there's too much material. I mean, but we have, I have, you know, artists' renditions of people who thought they could figure out what the monument would a be. A giant bust of yeah. the mayor. Exactly. Or, that was that, that was one. the big fear. That was one, or or really, you know, really kind of kitschy, large uh, fountains surrounded by guys with machine guns, which is something right. that doesn't happen in Croatia anymore. Uh, but the idea of, you know, with monumentality comes formality. It becomes yeah. a not just that the object looks formal, but that you're asked to behave in a formal way. Uh, and structured, that's, and orderly, unfree way. So we were, yeah, so this was what was, we were trying to help him in a way because we wanted to do the project. We were trying to help him do a job that he wasn't doing, which he now appreciates, which is not to imagine his problems, but to imagine the problems that he would generate. 
Right, right. This is really, uh, you know, this is central to what good designers do, is to understand what problem it is that they're actually being called upon to solve. And what you all, regardless of whether you're in engineering or business or health sciences or something else, need to really be mindful of. Because you will not always be given the right problem to solve at the outset. There's a reason why people are reaching out to you to seek your help, because they don't know. <laughs> I mean, not always, but, but, but you need to at least hold that uh, uh, possibility. I, I, Ivan, I want to um, mention something to you that, and, you know, forgive me if I try to contextualize this in a broader, in a broader way, but, you know, there are so many different kinds of public space that probably a lot of these folks um, don't have in the forefront of their heads right now. So I thought I'd just mm -hmm. bring up uh, a few of them. Most all, most all of you will have been to one or more of these. You know, at the sort of monumental scale, the mall in Washington, D.C., basically a mile and a half mm -hmm. of choreographed... Um, this is half that length, but it's, it's pretty big. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it, well, so it, it really, you can, you can apprehend its, its, its giantness. Um, um, Millennium Park in Chicago, a newer that thing, which smaller, we carefully, actually, that. which is really interesting because it is, attempts to, it's a post myelin mm -hmm. kind of thing, so it's much more experiential, mm -hmm. uh, but it wanted to be uh, monumental, at least in that it wanted to make a big splash and for you to know where you were and all of that. Um, for anybody who's been to China, Tiananmen Square is, is overpowering, especially in this kind of control mm -hmm. uh, context. That is, it's very, very large. Um, and it's, it's clearly designed for a display of, 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 of a very large authority. And military power. Military power, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, at, the, at, you know, at the other end, you maybe have things like the High Line. Mm -hmm. How many people have been to the High Line Park in New York City? Me. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, a whole bunch of, uh, okay, so this is not entirely accidental. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, or even Paley Park, the tiny little, what they call Vest Pocket Park. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, or, or uh, uh, a favorite of mine by Machado and Sovetti, Robert Wagner Park, in, on, in, uh, down at the Battery. But all of these m make us realize that Public spaces, even spaces that are designed from the beginning to be public spaces, can have a wildly different character. Um, I wonder, you know, tell us about how you tried to, you have some diagrams mm -hmm. obviously about how these five different fountains are going to help to stitch together the city. Maybe you can talk a bit about scale there as yeah. well. Well, I mean, I, know I went through a lot of it fairly quickly, but one of the things What's very strange about that space is that it's not just that it's big, it's, it's 800 meters, which, what is that, 800 yards, so it's like 2,000 feet yeah, long, yeah. it's yeah. 2,000 feet long, but at times it looks very small, and at times it looks very long because of just it being recessed and it being kind of a long uh, void. So we, and people like the void aspect of it. I mean, the average citizens who live around there like having a void. They mm. can play there, they can, mm -hmm. and it also is a relief in a way, in a way from even that part of the city. Um, so, first of all, the challenge of maintaining a void and putting something in that void mm -hmm. is, is a, is a mm -hmm. tricky thing. But then on the other hand, creating, this was the idea, we really started right away with the idea that there was going to be thirds to the space. So that the central third, we could afford to kind of densify, mm -hmm. we thought, without losing the void. So mm -hmm. it still felt like, a, a, you know, not just that there was things inside of a space, but there was a zone inside of another zone. Right. And it, and it, it's hard, we don't even have the right terminology to explain a lot of these things in architecture, but that game of fullness and emptiness was particularly important in this space. And we felt not only as a way to keep it from becoming overly saturated, but also even to make those little moves, and they're very little, uh, still change the entire impact uh, of the project. Right. Well, it seems to me that the kind of, if you had to distill this thing down after the fact, after all of the uh, decisions uh, mm -hmm. and ch questioning the question and so forth. The real magic moment is making a volume out of something ephemeral yeah. that you can pass through, that can just go away with the turn of a switch, mm -hmm. that can have things projected on it, 
that is there and not there at the same time. I mean, without that yeah, it's, breakthrough, it's not possible to do a lot of the things you're talking about. Is that right? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think that's what we counted on, the idea that you could literally turn on a urbanism, turn on an almost little city, and by the time the five fountains are built, and I, I hope they will be, you really will be able to go from an experience of almost a little neighborhood to a void. Um, and that's something that it, it's interesting that everyone understands. Mm. There's an issue of legibility here, too, where you know, monuments people understand a certain way, and then space is sometimes illegible, experience is illegible. What's interesting about this is that somehow, without being monumental, it's legible. Mm -hmm. Pe people mm -hmm. know how to use the space. I spent a, a day with my dad, who's a physicist, you know, mm -hmm. very um, a metric driven guy. And you know, he asked me what the hypothesis was, and I told him. <laughs> and then he's like, okay, how are you evaluating it? And I explained it. But you know, even just from watching the people use the space, there was a kind of, there was not exactly what we intended, but generally it, al it allowed for a certain experience. Right, it didn't right. prevent other kinds of experiences. Right. Well, now, th th see, I think that's a great thing that I think folks might be quite interested in is once we get to the five, I think it's, it's very different having two yeah. and then ultimately having five. Two, there's a either or, there's the teens yeah, and, and the family, <laughs> right? And w which maybe self selects and is yes. not really much to do with the content. It's Other not than as though. Two of them, yeah. yeah. Uh, are, are there, do you expect, do you anticipate mm, programming more specifically the, the, the five fountains? Because once you get to a certain number, yeah. it seems like you might. You might, you know, they might get more specific as to what part of the city they're next to. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, I think, I think that's a really good point. So we, had an, we have another problem right now, is that while the public is very engaged, um, these, this is a kind of instrument for space making. And so we actually need someone to curate it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now it's not such a problem. There's two of them, and there's five of them. Um, you know, we actually would really love someone from the city or from the, the symphony hall, which is right nearby, to almost curate it because yeah, it's not that yeah. it's not a passive thing. It requires it, it it requires interaction, but it also requires curation. And that I mean, just to, to back up, that's what the five fountains will change. Right. You know, someone actually getting involved. And we've that's why we've also the left the two the thirds are intended to be you know event spaces. One is generally more the right size for a small uh, pickup game of soccer. The other one's generally the right size for a concert. But you know, those are loose approximations. Right. But now, having those machines really in right. the space right. will call people to get more involved. And we're, this is something we're literally negotiating. It's like how, it's actually similar with the campus planning in a way. Managing, you give someone an instrument, and really, you have to teach them how to manage it, too. Right. Well, you know, um, I'm, now I'm going to ask you another question about um, spaces that you've been to. Um, how many people here have been to Paris? Okay, good. Well, travel group. No, I know it's, it's, it's remarkable how, how uh, you know. If you'd asked this question in my freshman class in in, in college, you know, like there would have been one half on. <laughs> but anyway, Paris, Texas. Yeah, Paris, <laughs> exactly. But um, now a much trickier one. How many of you have been to uh, the Parc La Villette in Paris? Half hand. Wow, we got a half hand. All right. Well, the reason I ask, of course, is it's, it's well known to architects, mm -hmm. uh, designed by Bernard Schumi, but but the programming of the little individual pavilions in that park is as specific as it could possibly be. We definitely want to avoid that. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting because I think um, my guess is on that continuum, right. um, you've acknowledged that you're, it's either you or people from Zagreb mm -hmm. or somebody, is pro it will be better if there is a more self-conscious thinking about this, even as flexible as the... Now, is each fountain, does it have exactly the same dimensions? Exactly the same dimensions, exactly yeah. the same technology. Right. The same, like, software actually running it, which is kind of interesting, too. So, mm. but, but it's interesting because you should look this project up. It's an interesting project, and I think it's kind of a diametrically opposite of what we were going after in the sense that um, it was a project where there was a very specific idea of what would happen that informed very specific architectural moves. And mm. we would sort of say the opposite. We would say we were trying to create formwork, frameworks, for things to happen, but we really didn't want to, not, we wanted to be responsible about the tools we give, we give you, but how you use them is sort of up to you. Right. And, but we want someone to kind of backseat drive, we want someone to, or front seat drive, right. come in like the Philharmonic or even this, you know, construction worker, you know, and create these uh, events to find, 
to find their way of kind of authoring the space. Whereas in Lavalette, there's a very specific one-to-one -one relationship. And it's interesting, the woman, the architect that I work with, she's from that generation, and we kind of had these discussions about that project mm -hmm. as being overly specific. Well, this is a great segue. Um, one could easily say, I think, that in France, and the French, perhaps, are um, La Villette is an expression of the national uh, predilection for order and prescription and, and in, a, in, a, in a very fine way. I mean, it's a, this is a park that is attempting to resolve a number of very specific forces in a very carefully designed city, Paris. Mm -hmm. um, that, that makes me want to ask a few more culturally uh, grounded questions about, about uh, the project in Croatia. Mm -hmm. First off, how, do, how would you say that, um, and, and, and this may sound like an, a, a difficult question, but I don't, I don't think so. How, how, do, how do the spaces, your spaces differ from those of the, commun the, the communist era? Like, right. you know, even of the same scale. Well, this is interesting because, so Zagreb was kind of blessed and cursed by being a kind of secondary capital. Mm -hmm. So it always, so there's an understanding of what I think there's an understanding of what a kind of dictatorial space would look like. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, uh, for better or for worse, Belgrade had to carry that obligation mm -hmm. because it was the capital. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you know, we, I mean, there's a kind of pride in Zagreb in saying, well, we, met, we weathered the storm mm -hmm. and we know what it looks like and we didn't have it. Mm -hmm. And so there's an even double whammy, um, I have to use a very technical term, fear of that. Uh, like, you know, that there was a proposal for this giant statue. It never got built. And it mm. wasn't coincidence. There, mm. was, there was a whole series of these kinds of stories. The, the most monumental thing in the, the whole city is this probably overscaled National Library that you saw in some of the mm -hmm. renderings. And people, and there's some renderings. I, I keep used, I'm so used to saying renderings in their photographs. It's a strange thing for me, <laughs> right. I have to admit. It's a nice thing. But the, the scale of that building is. Some people say is approaching, even though it was built in the 90s, is approaching a dictatorial scale mm -hmm. that people are not comfortable with, that even the Communist Party headquarters would never do right. in Zagreb, for example. The, right. most, the, right. the symbol right. of communist power in Zagreb was actually a fairly subdued, uh, nicely designed, well-situated, uh, humble building. Right. Uh, right. And so that's, that's an even, it's, there's, an ad, there's an understanding of communism, there's a, there's a particular experience, and so we're again having to kind of negotiate with these two experiences. So to provide a little bit of context for our, our students, um, in many capital cities of Soviet satellite, mm -hmm. now I realize that Yugoslavia had, it was, was different in but the it was, sense. It was, it was impressed with. Yeah. It, it had, it had <laughs> many, on the physical side, many of the consequences yes. were the same, even though the political umbrella was actually different. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, some of the most egregious examples, I suppose, are in Ceausescu's Romania. Yes. Well, that's uh, the largest Bucharest. building in Europe. I mean, it's literally. And, but the, the degree to which fabric was bulldozed yeah. and replaced with the monuments of that uh, political order. But that's, 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 that's exactly the reference that we discussed, was that, look, during communism, because of a number of things, including architects, which were, I would say, very responsible, mm -hmm. that didn't happen. Right. And so, but there was a fear that all of a sudden, after communism, this mayor or new politicians who claim to be anti-communist right, were actually going to literally, and they were, there's proposals yeah. for this site that look in this new free market economy right, right. like the spaces of Ceausescu. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the discussion we were having and saying, well, look, you know, this isn't even the identity of the city. And it's really, it was really helpful to make it clear to the mayor and to you know, other constituencies that this isn't the right direction you just want to go. You right. made it, you don't want to do it again. <laughs> right, right. Or for the first time. Well, and it looks like Zagreb has such an undisturbed, unlike some yeah. of these other places, oh, yeah. undisturbed city fabric yeah. um, that is really remarkable. I mean, it, seeing it in some of these photographs, actually, even though I've seen uh, a lot of the images in your, in your book, um, it's, it, it's uh, extremely distinctive and unique and un large swaths that are unfettered. Um, so I can appreciate why this monument, non-monument uh, agenda was, was so pressing. Um, I mean, the interesting thing is the band of space, however, that you were being it's asked monumental. to work on is, is yeah. the most megalomaniacally monumental that you, you yeah, know. It's the weirdest, and that space is maybe five miles long, actually. Oh. And it's something that's left over from, it's actually left over from a plan in the 1930s it's not even a communist plan, it was just something that was drawn 
and it became part of this public, if not an architectural imagination, really like everyone knows about this, the central axis, mm -hmm. and no one can explain to you what it is, right. but they know it exists, and it's this virtual idea that's kind of powerful and yet ambiguous, and so it makes things very difficult. It got drawn on a map, it, it stayed just, on a map. And it stayed and, in the brain. Right, right, right. Um, now, uh, this is a, something I, I genuinely have, I have no idea what the answer is here. Yeah. Great. Um, part of a, a, a interviewing, I suppose, is asking, is like uh, uh, being an attorney and asking qu only questions that you think you know the answer to. This is one I don't know the answer to at all. Okay. Um, how important was multicultural acceptance of something like this in Zagreb? In other words, I, I'm betraying my ignorance of its demographic, but yeah. I assume that, that there must have been some need to, in public life, not side only with one team, let's say, at the expense of another. Well, yeah, this is, I mean, again, that's why I just showed a few of these, I abstracted the symbols that we were dealing with. So there was a king on a horse. There was a, actually another mayor that the mayor is infatuated with becoming, whose statue is nearby, mm -hmm. which was the reason that people thought there was going to be a statue in the space right. of the new mayor, and right. people aren't sure that he's not going to do that later. Um, so it was really, again, the idea, and there is even graffiti um, on this, there's a, there's a kind of a, electric, a power box where it's been graffitied already by one political party who feels that there's not enough symbolism. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, um, yeah, it, I mean, I mean, it's I mean, not Croatia, nationalistic yeah, enough. It's or? not nationalistic enough. So it's not that it's, it's, it's a Croatian party that's insisting on a more Croatian nest for the site. Right, right. Even though it's a, you know, the city is multicultural and there's a, there's a big sort of Serbian Orthodox population. And then there's also a Muslim population. There's actually the largest single investment of Iran in Europe was to build a mosque in 1979 in Zagreb. Huh. And this huh. is a very modernist mosque, mosque with a giant minaret that you can see. Actually, right. you can see it from the site, you can see it from the photographs. So we, yeah, it's, it was trying not to engage that right. in a way. Um, but I think, you know, again, the people that, uh, developing kind of still legible symbols about the place right. that don't necessarily engage in that discussion because we felt like that discussion was not even relevant at this right, point. Right. But this is, I will say, it is certainly not only in Zagreb where um, the forces of history and even historic preservation can collide with contemporary attitudes about inclusion yeah. to great complexity. Um, in other words, uh, on the one hand you might say, well, how, how can you criticize me? I'm just trying to preserve our history. Right. Another person might say, yeah, our cultural heritage. And before you know it, that heritage is, 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 is being perceived as a, as a cudgel. And that's why public space is such a complex design enterprise, I think. Um, OK, now uh, let me ask you um, a, a bit more about this whole experiential um, business. Um, the, um, the, it seems that we're using, um, you know, the High Line is a great mm -hmm. example. We're using the infrastructure of movement mm -hmm. more for whether it's more innocuous like rails to trails mm -hmm. or whether it's more culturally intentional as with the High Line. We're using, we're reusing infrastructure mm -hmm. for public space making purposes. I wonder if you thought about that at all. Yeah, well, no, I think, I, I'm, to be honest, um, you know, we have another colleague who's very interested in public space and coexistence of infrastructure in public space. He was here uh, two meetings ago. Dan Adams, and, and I, you know, and I've known Dan for a long time, and I, we both have some similar fat professors in the past, and I, I think, you know, in some ways we share this desire to, for, you know, uh, for both and, uh, in the sense that, um, you know, instead of seeing this as a kind of aggressive highway planning move, um, and it's not as large scale as some of these other projects. Although it is lifted up, it's just that the level of the city is even higher. It has to do with flooding and so on and so forth. So in a way... So it's like a levee? It's a levee, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. It used to flood, so they lifted it up, long story short. Mm -hmm. um, and so we thought, well, you know, again, there's a lot of, it's created actually, in, in, the, in the end, that honestly, we're struggling to maintain what is a really beautiful space when you're inside of a, what was, it, you know, this kind of green bowl, like being inside of a giant green bathtub. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and so really, and then also, again, the idea that there's these cars and this, this uh, space continues to function as a major 
not just artery, but as a kind of a symbolic, like you know, like if you're Croatian or even if you're from the region, you're entering the city through that every time. It's mm -hmm. more like a, like a boulevard. Yeah. Uh, than it a is portal. Even. Even. A portal. And so, you know, so it was already culture. It, it, it made it maybe interestingly more difficult and that, that it wasn't just a piece of infrastructure, but it was already a cultural, you know, site as well as a piece of infrastructure. So we couldn't treat it like a found object. Mm -hmm. You know, we couldn't treat it. We, that's, a, that's a strategy that works. I think that's the strategy with the High Line even. Sure. With us, sure. it was, I mean, it's less beautiful maybe as a piece of asphalt, but as a dike and as an entry, it was given. So we kind of, we had to invent and we almost had to compete with it a little bit mm. in a way that I think the High Line reinvents. Mm -hmm. So we really had to invent. Right. Uh, right. It doesn't, it's not rooted so much in what's there. Mm -hmm. I wonder, um, one thing you didn't show as much, um, and you know, I realize that it's a complicated project with lots and lots going on, and so there's a limit. But I, I'm, the views from the city, um, you know, yeah, yeah. through those passages, is, is perhaps maybe a, a kind of traditional way of representing the connections of monuments to the city life, and just because they all happen to be in a line doesn't mean that there aren't discrete views, and I'm sure you've thought about where to locate yeah. them because of that. Well, I mean, I think, you know, there's the whole, there's, it's interesting with a project like this, um, you know, being an architect and then almost becoming like a photographer or becoming, a, you know, a, an anthropologist where you almost have to, even that the photos I have, those were shot in two days, you almost have to engage with it and almost design the documentation process, and I feel like yeah, looking at it from, there's a really important mountain that, that is part of the sequence, and you can see these fountains. I just haven't had a chance to photograph it, but, right. but it's a daily, it's a weekend ritual for people in Zagreb, we thought about, and you can actually see that space from like two kilometers away. Right. Uh, and so that's a, something we thought about. And then the other idea, which I do have photos of, and would have been more complicated to explain, is that you get all these cool views of the fountains disembodied in this kind of rural fabric, mm -hmm. which is where actually a lot of bars are and where a lot of students, the National Library is where students study, so they sort of sprinkle across the, <laughs> the site to the bars on the other side. And I've even had a few, I've, I have one great photo that I'll have to share with George later on where I've, I found, a, there was a bar that literally had, they, um, they carved out a new window just, just to, to get the view. Right, and so right. they now they're like the fountain bar. I mean, right. it's great. I mean, that was a real compliment. And so that layer, I think, is something that I'm also conscious of kind of studying through and getting some more feedback. And especially since we're gonna, the, the fountains are set. We can't unfortunately right. change the position, but understanding a little bit about, you know, what's happened now and even with the seating, how we can change the project right. in minor right. ways. Right. Well, at this point, I wanna shift to the words that we have, we have been using uh -huh. to try to weave together all of our different guests. And mm -hmm. those words are context, question, empathy, iteration, visualization, innovation, metrics, and leadership. Oh. <laughs> and so we're gonna do that in like three seconds, no. Um, context, I think we've been very clear about as, a, as sort of the core for this talk. I think also questions, you were very clear about how you had to mm, reframe the question and then I guess kind of subtly or explicitly um, represent it to the mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, I'm gonna suspect, rather than questioning, you know, you just show something and that it is actually the answer to questions that had not yet been asked. Well, in a way, the project did that. More than even any presentation, we, we sort of realized that it was somewhat impossible. Right, 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 right. But one of the words that we used, we've been using a lot, and I think to great effect, um, and one that really took me by surprise last spring when we had my friend Peter Dixon, the uh, branding and identity expert from New York. He said the most powerful word for him in his professional life at this point, this is a guy who rebrands everything for McDonald's, for um, Samsung. I mean, he's, he's created just billions of dollars in new value for these companies. He said, and I thought, what is it? Some secret computer program? <laughs> no, <40. laughs> yeah, it's, it's empathy. And it is understanding the world from the perspective of another. It's understanding what another business uh, uh, visitor last time, Mark Meyer of the Business School, called the latent um, uh, demands of a product rather than the explicit ones. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if when you, talk, when you think about empathy 
and you think about the users or the multiple, you know, we talk about constituents and stakeholders, but I, maybe you could say a couple words about how you perceived those um, sensibilities as different from, it, from each other. You, know, you have the mayor, you have, you have the, the kids, you have... Well, I think it was, it, honestly, it was the mayor and the, and the public. Not, not because the public is a generic group of people, but we under, we, I, I felt like we were, and this isn't a criticism of him, but we just, I felt like we understood the, not the public, but we understood, I think, a little better about how to engage the public. Mm -hmm. But so the trick was understanding that the mayor was not someone out to, was not only an egomaniac, mm -hmm. uh, was what actually in his own, that was the biggest challenge in terms of empathy of this project, having empathy for the mayor. Mm -hmm. um, again, like I saw, the first quote I showed was that a journalist accused Project Zagreb but actually justifying his mandate because they saw him as someone who's overactive, mm -hmm. who's like out there solving problems as opposed right. to thinking always through it. Through, and, right. and that's something that I feel like really helped us in the process was to say, we're not gonna alienate, we're not gonna, well, we, you know, of course he's the client in a way, but beyond that, like having an empathy with him, with, well, for him and his way of seeing things was probably what kept the project going. Right. Whereas the public, I think, have, I think we guessed pretty well, I think the photographs have reaffirmed that I think we were quite empathic about user experience, but, but his kind of view mm -hmm. of monumentalism, his view of, of course himself, I mean he right, was the person right, right, behind right. Uh, these projects, that was where I would say our empathic challenge lay, because we were more sympathetic, more empathic with the public than we were with this guy, you right, know? Right, and so right. that, was, that was the challenge and that was I think where the trick in the project, um, the success of the project lay. No, oh, that's great, that, that's, that's interesting. Now, Thinking about the process that you went through, you know, one of the things, of course, you, you know, an, uh, among Ivan's many hats, uh, he, he runs the freshman uh, design studio experience within the School of Architecture, does a fantastic job, but the, one of the things that students often kind of stumble on dealing with, especially after they're really high performing students in high school, mm -hmm. is they start architecture school and the iterative nature of design, the idea that you do it again and again and again and again is something that I think that, it, you know, is not first nature. Um, yeah, and it's interesting because the, I, I know we have, you know, people from sciences and from other fields, but it's, uh, you know, my, because my understanding of iterations come from the sciences, it's come right. from trial and error, right, from right. almost the scientific method, because we, we sometimes assume that, that scientists know what they're going to do right. because of some body of knowledge. And actually, they're the biggest iterators of all, right? right. And so I think the, I think the iteration is, is key. But what, just to make a point about this project, is that for us, iteration, this project was, but was also looking at all of the failed and semi-proposed projects, many of which I didn't show, and thinking of them almost as our proposals. Mm -hmm. And thinking of them, like really, not just saying, oh, we're gonna learn from them, but, but being responsible for their problems. Mm -hmm. and taking them mm -hmm. on, like, mm -hmm. like, almost like empathy right. to the other architects, to even this traffic planner who I looked, you know, why was this traffic, uh, you know, route cut through this place? What was his motivation? Right, right. And that really helped, and, and almost like thinking of that as an iteration. Right. Thinking right, of that right. as, as part of our project. Part of your information gathering, part yeah. of the, yeah, that's interesting. Um, now, um, you know, obviously in our field, the, the digital transfer, the, the digital revolution has made visualizing things so effective that you can mistake rendering for photo uh, in your <laughs> presentation. Right. But um, surely for something as ephemeral as this, it must have been extremely powerful to be able to show the mayor and other constituents a kind of digital image of what this thing would actually be like. Well, you know, and it's interesting that the issue wasn't, the, the challenge we had, and again, I, I, there's so much material, but the challenge we had was showing the temporal nature of it. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, you know, I, I mean, I, I can do renderings, but learning how to simulate time mm -hmm. was something that was a challenge. And we did a lot of different kinds of simulations of how these things would fill space and would disappear. And that's something that we struggled with. Whereas mm -hmm. the kind of fixed image, it it's, honestly it was a little shocking to see the, at night, for example, the fountains, and, and not really knowing if that was a rendering right, that I had seen. So similar. It was so similar, um, and that's something that also has taken time because I, those, you know, those renderings we have, we had. I didn't show you. We have professional renderings which mm -hmm. look more realistic, mm -hmm. but I found them. Those are my renderings from the mm -hmm. beginning of the project mm -hmm. when we were, there were more design renderings as opposed to presentation right. renderings, and I would say that they look more like the experience in a way. Right. But the temporal aspect was something that you know they were very. The, the mayor was very interested in even, uh, very, and, and we had a difficult time representing because 
we honestly realize as much as we're interested in this, we still think of things as more aesthetic objects. Right, right. Just to be a little self-critical. And, right. and I think we're still struggling. It's taken us six months to get, this, I didn't show you any videos of it, but believe it or not, the, they're quite good now, but the movement of the, these walls of water, mm -hmm. that took us six months to figure out. And it, was, and it was really, and that's when we realized, holy crap, we're still in the design process. Right, 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 right. Well, I actually, that will continue with or without you yeah. in the in developing the like maintenance protocols to assure that that the we worked with and actually that's that's been that's a good thing with the mayor where really he's a, he didn't let us talk to the public but we've had a good relationship with kind of the team of people there's a kind of park service in Zagreb and we've really worked with them from the beginning so that at least because also he sees them as his yes yes, yes, them. yes, <laughs> so. yes. so now this is you know this is this is a funny question in a way to ask an architect because it's different than asking a uh, a car designer mm -hmm. um, and it's about innovation mm -hmm. because when uh, Henrik Fisker was sitting here um, it was of course I am trying to innovate um, a, at a, at scale I am intending for this vehicle to be sold to 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. There will be 100,000 of them. So this is not a, this is not a car for you. Mm -hmm. This is a car for a, a bunch of people, and it is to serve as a prototype for mm -hmm. a, a bunch of others. How do you see? I mean, this is really you know, public space is about as fundamentally place-based a thing as you can get, right? Mm -hmm. Like a house, you could conceivably pick up on, off of it, jack up off of its foundations, put it on a truck and take it somewhere else. Doesn't happen that often. Occasionally it does. But the layout of the house, for example. But the layout of the house is now, but, but of this kind of a thing, do you, how, how, do you, how do you think about it in terms of innovation in the sense of scaling uh, change? Well, I think this is where a little bit of the buildup of the lecture, I think, helps explain it, too. The idea that, you know, architects don't, I mean, car designers even at least get to touch, like, a mock-up or they get to touch, like, a ceramic, um, you know, full-scale mock-up of it. And, they, and, of course, they get to test it before it goes in the market. So with architects, the idea that you're innovating an object is always a little dubious to me. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, you know, the process that, the process we were, that I was forced to go into more as someone who's, not really living in Croatia also, but it's somewhat transnational, uh, to develop a process, to work with the mayor, to think about how the public was gonna respond. I think that's what's innovative and that's what's prototypical about mm, the process. Mm -hmm. And it's actually what makes, what's made Croatia, and it probably won't last, but for the last 20 years, what's made Croatia interesting is that it's not a chaotic place compared to many places in the world, and it's not the most ordered place, but it's a kind of interesting lab in that sense for certain kinds of projects. Like I said, it's not, you know, it, it wasn't the most radical communist dictatorship, um, and it's not currently, you saw, you know, there's almost, the, those, those little towns borderline on informal housing, but they're just, they're just little rural houses. Right. So, in a way, there's a kind of genericness to, it's not a generic, I mean, you have to specifically respond to it, but the process, there's a mayor, there's a public that right. has some animosity, he's afraid of them, they're critical of him, and you're in the middle, and that, that's and then how do you negotiate that process? I feel like that's what's well. That, that's a very that's a very good answer, actually. The the idea that the innovation lies more in the process that is getting developed mm -hmm. than in the in, in 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 the single artifact or collection of or or landscape that results. I mean, I'm not. This isn't to say it's not no, I mean, interesting I think, or innovative, but yeah, the, I mean, but I, the but the takeaway might be how to deal with. Yeah. Um, this more prototypical situation, which is a, one of process. Because we had, I mean, just the specific examples, we had, we had a great fountain consultant, right? And this guy, he's Croatian, but he's a basketball player in Utah for a long time, interesting guy. And he is Mr. Innovative Fountain Guy. He's right. done, I don't know, 280 fountains, mostly in the Middle East and, I don't know, uh, huh? in, in America and China, everywhere. You know, he's at the top of his game. He knows right. the nozzles. Right, I, right, I, right, I mean, right. we worked with him on it, but, you know, they're his nozzles. I'm right, not going right. to... Right, I'm not right. going to claim that, but I think what you know, what what I found really powerful again, and what's innovative is giving people, giving anyone a, a, a sense, like a, taking apart something they know, a space they know, a process they know, a, uh, and saying, look, it really isn't just, it isn't a thing, right? It's a it's a set of decisions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then let's step back and say, well, public space is the ultimate set of decisions. So you know, we can talk about what you think you want it to look like, but you know, and I know 
that there's going to be a process here, there's going to be a way that's going to be used. So let's step back. Let's say, what space do you like, or what procedure yeah, yeah, did yeah. you enjoy? Let's look at that. Right. And it, here, we'll take it apart for you. Right. And then we're not going to copy it because you can't copy it. But you, we're, we're, we understand all of the relationships, all of the players, and that's what we did. Uh, there's a we looked took, looked at some of the public spaces that a lot of people took for granted and said, look, the procedure wasn't so different. 100 years ago, right. the, the, the animosities weren't so different, mm -hmm. and, and the spatial effects that people wanted weren't so different. So let's look at those, and let's, let's build a narrative right. through those, and then we can understand, let's get around the monument or not monument right, issue. Right, 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 that's great. Well, okay, a couple more things, and then in the meantime, I want uh, people who have questions to, to be getting ready here. But um, the, the notion of metrics for something like public space, you, know, you have to understand these. You, can, you have to imagine these questions as applied to yeah, the yeah. designs of toasters, yeah. um, it's of, great. Of, it's of, great. Of, of of business plans, of all kinds of things. But when the mayor said, I mean, his metric is re-election. Totally, literally and, down to the day. <laughs> right. He won, so that metric. Right, 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 right. <laughs> right. Mission accomplished. Boom. This <laughs> yeah. is a great project. Okay. If you want Next. to be re-elected, hire me. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, careful what you wish for. <laughs> He'll become a gracious kingmaker. <laughs> um, but, but the other, other metrics might be um, visitors per, you know. Uh, well, cost, for example. Yeah, is well, well, yeah, like visitors per dollar spent, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, mm -hmm. And did, you know, did they talk to you about that sort of thing? Oh, yeah, well, it's funny. I mean, this was the only project I've ever done where not only did we not go over budget, our budget was cut in half in the middle of the process because of the crisis. Right. So the, the cost of this first phase is exactly the same price as the Norwegian ambassador's house. And so, if, so that's an interesting metric, how many people get to go to the Norwegian ambassador's house in Zagreb. Right, right, I mean, that's, right, right, right. that's what I've used with, with journalists, so I'm ready for this. Right, 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 <laughs> right, 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 right. And because this was the issue of how many, this was the metric, how many kindergartens could you build with this frivolous, the cost oh, this is a great, so I'm so glad we asked yeah, this. Yeah, and so I was like, well, one sixteenth of a kindergarten, or right. one eighth of a kindergarten, and the, what, how many kids are gonna use one eighth of a kindergarten? Right. But the Norwegian ambassador's house was exactly the same budget as the first phase, right, when right. we got it cut, because it was twice that before. Mm. Um, and that made it very clear whether people liked that or not. It made right. it very clear right. what the balance was in terms of public impact right. Right. and cost. Right, 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 right. I'll, uh, remind me to talk to you about this at greater length in the future because <laughs> choosing the right metric is the key to winning almost any argument. Just note, note that. Um, but uh, finally, the whole question of leadership, and we, we included this this time around because, you know, I think one of the cores of this course is um, that design is not a, a frivolous topping, but that it 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 is a powerful analytic. And, and and tool for action and decision making, and those that suggests to me that it is also a powerful tool for leadership. And certainly, you guys participated with the mayor mm -hmm. in leading a public conversation um, about public space in, in Zagreb. Well, we failed in that part. Mm. I would I mean and I think that was something that I would have liked to have happened. It didn't happen, okay. and it's unfortunate because that's where I think his. That's where the communist heritage honestly came up, right. was that he wanted to help the public and he thought he was helping the public, but in the one key area where he could have helped the public and he didn't, and he's caused a lot of negative reaction, was just by not engaging the public right. and having a conversation. Right. We were ready to do it. We, we engaged the professional community once. We had mm -hmm. a, that was the most he would allow us. Right. And right. He, I mean, we had to write, you know, we had to sign release statements once the project got a little clearer that we wouldn't. And I'm, I'm actually surprised it never leaked. It's Croatia, everything leaks, but, right. um, but no, nothing ever leaked. And we did not have this opportunity to have a discussion about public space. Wow. That would have been a really productive discussion. And even right. now, he doesn't seem to want to. Now, now because you know, it undermines his authorship, too. Yeah, yeah. And so it's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. And he, maybe he'll see this on, <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> on YouTube, right. Yeah. Um, OK, I want to open it up for questions from you guys. We have, have uh, any questions here? for our guests, or comments. <laughs> Angry brickbats, here we go, yes. Hey, uh, how you doing? Um, I was just curious, um, when you were talking about the campus design, mm -hmm. um, you said that you staged a competition for that, and I was mm -hmm. curious why you chose to do that, and whether you think that competitions are more efficient in terms of you know, creating good designs, and what your input is on that. Well, that's a great question. Um, so in that project, not only did we stage it, we designed the competition. 
But in, in Croatia, all public projects have to go through a competition process. And that's not a, that's not a God-given law. That was lobbied by architects. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, that's, this, if you want to know more about that process, it's in the Silver Book. But architects lobbied in the 90s to make sure that the public investments would go through uh, competition, and that, that at least 50% of the jury would be architects, and that the Society of Architects would be involved. So it's very important. We had, and the university, honestly, would have liked to have not had a competition. Mm, it would have been a lot course. cheaper. Um, it would have been a lot easier. Um, and then it's funny, the EU wanted to control it in different ways. The EU also is funding the project. So it's very complicated. But I would say that competitions, it all, it's all, it's, again, this is, they're like a design of, the, you design a competition, and the design of the competition impacts the results. Um, and so we spent four years to prepare a competition that lasted th three months. Right, um, and I think we got the best project. We, also, I th we had 16 entries, which is relatively small, of which two were people that clearly went to these workshops, and 14 of people that just missed the boat. Mm -hmm. So it was really funny to see. Um, but the fact that we could get uh, feedback from someone who wasn't involved in the process, uh, but who had been educated, honestly, through the process, something that, again, the public, we, we, we could have done with public space. This is why I'm upset about the public space process. We didn't do that. in. We didn't generate any knowledge, unfortunately, I think, in the, in the fountains. They're very nice fountains, but we didn't generate knowledge. In, in the competition, the campus, which is still not built, there's a, uh, we've generated a lot of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the campus, and preparing a competition was the key to that knowledge. So there, it was almost like being a pedagogue mm -hmm. uh, instead of being a designer. And that was, that was very productive. I think um, you know, the university would have saved some money by hiring Suzaki, for example, associates, or by hiring yeah, and they do a lot of campus planning. They were lobbying for hard. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They've done some work in creation. But, you know, in the end, I think we've got a really great project out of it. And just, you know, since they haven't paid me very much for it, they've <laughs> saved a lot of money. <laughs> well, one, one thing that's also interesting on this vein is because you guys are all on a campus that has been dramatically, dramatically re-imagined yeah. uh, over the last 15, 20 years. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen it pictures of like, should be aerial real. photographs <laughs> of Northeastern campus, even as recently as like 1990. Yeah. It, it, it looks like a complete, it, it's, it's as different as if it had been in, you know, a communist era. Uh, I mean, it's, the makeover is that extensive. Um, but in the US, in stark contrast with Europe, the number of uh, college campuses, as you alluded to, are really the last bastion of what we might call single author planning known to man. Uh, if there once was a time when the Pope, of, the Pope designed all of Rome, <laughs> when the Pharaoh designed all of Egypt, um, and it used to be that city planning was an extremely top-down enterprise, usually by a monarch, um, the only vestige of that, interestingly, that I know of that's still really, uh, maybe outside of the Middle East, mm -hmm. is, um, is the American University. <laughs> where it is a really singular, and they, you know, they, there's ne hardly ever a competition. There's certainly no obligation to have one. Yeah. one a, a school might choose to, but, but because a competition is really about um, the willingness to spread authority either to professionals, like the, the idea that Croatia agreed to the, the, the idea that half the jury had to be architects. That was a big thing. It's not even typical in Europe. I mean, yeah, that strikes me as quite... Shocking. That would be a huge deal in the United States. I'm very involved with the public review process on big buildings in, in the Boston area. And we're constantly trying to find ways to get architects involved in that more, but it's not a given. So it's a very interesting subject. Yeah. And even educa just education in all European countries until recently was, artificial education was dictated the relationship between how an architect was trained and the idea that you would have this privilege of being having a competition system were linked. So you had to be technically, tr you had to have some, I would say, a high degree of technical competency. It's changing for the society at large to allow you yep. to have these competitions because otherwise you weren't prepared and people right. out of school have won these competitions. Right. Other questions? Okay. Well, Ivan, I want to thank you very much. Thank you.